Good morning, and thank you um, for having me. Uh, this is one of um, my favorite things to talk about, is this genetic risk and what it is, how important it is for women to, to be aware of this. Not everybody meets criteria for doing this, but you certainly should know so that you can you know, be aware of there are uh, programs, or this program is available to patients and their families to evaluate whether or not they are at high risk or um, at an average risk for developing cancer. I'm going to refer a lot to, of this to both breast. Some of it may be just specific to breast, but this program covers all cancers, so, and it's open both to men and women. Um, the genetic risk assessment program it offers um, counseling and testing um, for individuals and their families who are at an increased risk for developing cancer. Uh, by understanding this cancer risk, patients can take ownership or a proactive step towards reducing their risk. For patients who've already had breast cancer or any cancer, knowing whether or not they carry a gene mutation can actually make a difference in how they are treated. There are certain medications that can be used for people that are genetic uh, mutation carriers. So the goal of the um, program is really just in a crowd of people especially, uh, to find out who is it that would uh, be developing, who are at high risk for developing cancer. So what we'll talk about this morning is uh, just genetics 101, really, really basic. Um, I don't want to bore you. Uh, sporadic versus family versus hereditary. What does that mean? Everybody thinks that, oh yeah, my mom had breast cancer, so I'm going to get it. Or, you know, it's, it's genetic. But I'll explain a little bit about what the differences are. And then we'll talk about um, the clues. What does that say? On Clues and red flags, sorry, I'm reading from up there. <laughs> and um, what, what, what are we looking at? What, why are we singling out individuals for um, um, genetic risk assessment and testing? And then the, um, the key components of a risk assessment, what happens when you come in to see me? What are we looking for? What are we talking about? And how do I, or how does your family history and your personal history determine whether or not you meet the criteria for testing? And finally, um, we're going to just put it all together. So um, this is a busy slide, but what I do want to just bring out is that one in three men and one in two women will develop breast cancer over um, their lifetime. Um, up to the age of 80. So we're looking, when we talk about lifetime, we talk about up to the age of 80. If you're 40, we want to know what your lifetime risk is from the time, uh, from 40 to 80. So, not all cancers are created equal, okay? A majority of the cancers that we diagnose are um, just sporadic. In other words, they happen. There's no family history, or it's just that one person in the family that just happens to have developed the cancer. The, the second uh, cancer is familial. Now, this is what most people are, uh, are, are familiar with. In other words, grandma, mom, and aunt all had breast cancer. And that take, that's not as high a, or um, a bigger group as the sporadic group. Now, the smallest group is what we call hereditary cancers. There's a gene mutation that runs in the family um, that we know would, that explains the cancers in, their fam in the family and is also putting that individual, if they don't have cancer, at higher risk. Can I turn this off? Thank you. Can you hear me okay without this? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot we were on Facebook. <laughs> Okay, so um, on this slide, it's going to look a little bit busy, but cancers are, are, are complicated. It, there's not a one-size-fits-all reason why we develop it. So you, it could be age, getting older, um, the environment, just whether we're exposed to it 
inhaling the toxins, touching them, or even eating them. Um, other things, smoking, alcohol, um, whether or not you exercise, type of diet you eat, and of course, the big thing, family history. So the basics for uh, the basic um, unit or, or thing is uh, the or of an organism is the cell, and this is very, very hopefully not too too complicated. But each cell, you know, we get a gene from mom and a gene from dad. These genes are the blueprint for which you know determines our eye color, our height, our weight. You know. Um, whether or not we can um, stick our tongues out and roll them versus somebody that can't. So these are all genetic pieces and these are information that we have in our, um, in our bodies. So um, when we're looking at this, this is an, in, the, the, each chromosome, each gene has a specific job, if you will. And if these job, if, if these genes have a mistake in it, then it's not gonna be able to do its job. You can go forward. Yeah. So when I'm talking about mistakes, um, let me see, can you forward the, uh, there you go. Each gene has a spelling, okay? So if you think of the fat cat ate the rat, and the, it, all of our genes are, um, if you were to read it in a sentence or a paragraph, there are some mistakes that can occur. Some of them do not make, they make sense, but they're a change, but it's okay. It's not gonna cause us to, to, to be at risk for anything. Um, so in the first example, the K is changed from the C, but it sounds the same. It's not, you know, anything that's gonna be, um, say, detrimental to the individual. Let's just say that that particular change may be eye color. In the second one, um, this one is where there's something that's inserted. So you can see there that there are proteins that are inserted, so this may be something that may put an individual at risk. And the third one is um, the, where the information is missing. So um, there's maybe some proteins there that are missing, and um, in that case, then uh, again, it may change the individual's um, risk for developing the disease. Okay, so. Um, when we look at cancers, hereditary cancers, we're looking at it and how, how it is inherited. So all you need is one broken gene from either parent and each first degree relatives. That means that the, the children will have a 50% chance of inheriting that gene. So if you look at this couple here, dad actually is the gene mutation carrier. So half of the children May, will inherit that particular gene, and then the other half will not. So let's talk a little bit about the key components of the risk assessment. Patients always ask me, what are you looking for? I mean, I already know I have cancer or there's cancer in my family, so what's the big deal? Well, here's what, we're, what most of us want is the um, how to prevent, or it is the in prevention of cancer, okay, identifying individuals, and early detection, okay? So this is the part that we want to get out there and make sure that women or men um, get their, the appropriate screening. This is where we can, you know, make a huge difference in finding cancers early. And then the second part of this continuum is for those that have developed cancer. So you're looking at someone who now has the disease, but what is their risk for developing a second cancer? For example, gene mutation carriers have up to a 60% risk for developing a second cancer, either in the same breast 
or in the opposite breast. So this is why we, we test women, because this is where their decision-making process comes in. Uh, and then, of course, we're looking at um, how are we going to treat these women? How do we, there are certain medications that we can, we can advocate for and make sure that they take. Um, options are maybe surgeries that would reduce their risk. So these are all things that we talk about, but we're also including everything, including the risk assessment. So this is a whole continuum. And we're looking at everyone um, from, from start to finish, even um, through survivorship. So there are a couple ways to, um, that we refer to my program, or our program, I shouldn't say mine, um, is one for an, a referral from your primary care physician. So, you know, they can either fax a copy or send, you know, uh, a copy of a referral or they can send it through the um, medical record. The second group of individuals that we actually get referred from are women who are seen at the breast, cancer, uh, breast center. Now, women who come in, we know women come in for their annual mammograms. We're hoping that we are going to be able to screen them all so that we know, hey, you know, in 20 women that we did today, five of them were considered at an elevated risk and maybe they should come and see me. The appointments, once you make the appointment, we make it easy. You, we send you a link and you fill out the, the um, information on the tablet or on your phone. And then by the time you get in to see me, all of that information is already ready to go. So we're not sitting there trying to collect family history while we're sitting together. All of that's been done. So it makes it a little easier. So what's in a consult? What do we talk about? What, what, um, what are some of the things that I look for? Uh, we look at your, family, your personal history. What is, um, do you smoke? Do you drink? Have you had an abnormal biopsy? Sometimes those um, abnormal biopsies can actually put you at an elevated risk for cancer. For example, if you've had something called atypia, that will put your risk up to two, to, two and a half to five times more. Um, we look at your family history, talking about you know who had what. Um, we're looking at certain cancers, whether or not they group together. Um, and then based on all of that, um, we are also uh, talking about um, what are your risk factors? What, what, what are some of the things that maybe you have, well, what you can do to reduce your risk? Um, those that meet certain criteria will uh, be offered genetic testing. And then those that don't, but still meet, you know, that are still at an elevated risk, we will, you know, talk to them about, well, you know, you're at high risk, you don't need genetic testing, but let's talk about how other things can help with early detection. So risk factors, what are risk factors? There's, they are um, anything that an individual is exposed to, um, characteristics, uh, a lifestyle, it could be, uh, that increases the likelihood of developing a, di a disease. This is busy, so we're not going to, you know, go into too much of it, but this is how I look at it, and this is how I explain it to the patients when they come in. Looking at what you start out with, being female and getting older, unfortunately, that's the bottom line. That's what we start out with. Um, women, and then women have a higher risk for breast cancer, and as we get older, our risk increases. Um, if you have dense breast tissue, if you've ever heard that when you got, went in for a mammogram, that is also a risk factor. Um, any personal history of breast cancer, we wanna know. Why? Because we wanna prevent the next one if it's gonna happen. And then the third one is race and ethnicity, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. Family history, basically groups of cancers, young cancers. Um, if, you, if you have a grouping of cancers, for example, say aunt had breast, mom had ovarian, uncle had prostate, grandma had pancreatic cancer, 
those cancers all in one side of the family is already a red flag for me. It's like, wow, you've got all these different cancers, but they do, um, they do signal a need for genetic testing, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, you could go quickly on these. Um, reproductive risk factors, um, when you start your periods early, when you stop your um, periods late, okay? Say you start at 11, and then your menopause is, say, at 55 or 58. This is all about the exposure of those natural hormones. So women who have had children versus ch women who don't incur a little bit more, women who do not have children incur a little bit more of a risk than those that do. Why? Because of the, in, again, the exposure to those natural hormones. Um, lifestyle, I'm pretty sure Tony will get into that. But, you know, again, this is, you know, alcohol intake. It has been shown that women who drink more than a glass a day will have an increased risk for developing cancer. Not just breast, but other cancers as well. Um, overweight, that goes into... Um, hormonal exposure again. Postmenopausal women who have an elevated or, or BMI, okay, who are overweight, the fat actually is stored or is made by the fat tissue, estrogen. The estrogen is from fat. So if you're supposed to not have estrogen and you, you know, are overweight, it is, there is a production of estrogen that you shouldn't be having. Um, a physical inactivity, and then alcohol and smoking. The other risk factors are, are just uh, abnormal biopsies. Um, women who've had lymphoma or a type of a cancer in which they had chest radiation as between the ages of, in their teens until their 30s, the breast tissue is continuing to make changes and the radiation that, um, that they use to be treated for the other cancer puts them at a high risk for also developing breast cancer. Okay. Chest wall radiation, there it is. Okay, next slide please. So when we look at, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the most single important risk factor is aging um, and being female. So, you know, the, the older we get, the higher the risk. Um, next slide. Um, gender. So women, of course, are, um, you know, have a, a higher risk versus men. But, you know, men also can develop breast cancer. It's not um, uncommon, but they do get breast cancer. So let's look at family history and why that's important. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, one, when a woman has a, a, a risk that's higher, um, it's because of a first, second, or third degree relative. So we're talking about mother, sister, daughter. Um, also, women who have a mother, uh, well, I just said that. <laughs> and then um, the risk is even higher if more than rel one relative is on the one side of the family. So when you're looking at um, cancer in an individual or multiple cancers in one side of the family. For example, mom had breast and ovarian cancer or like I said earlier, multiple family members, mom with breast, grandmother with ovarian, aunt with, um, with um, pancreatic cancer. All of those are grouped either in an individual or as a, um, as a group. One thing we also like to note is if somebody had a mutation, they were tested before. That is, an absolute, uh, that is an absolute, let's get you tested to see if you carry that risk, the same risk, and it will explain the cancers that are occurring in your family. 
Remember I said uh, culture. Uh, one of the groups, Ashkenazi Jewish, even I had a hard time learning to say that. This is a group of individuals that are from Eastern Europe. So when you look at uh, their, their uh, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Can you move the next slide? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so Ashkenazis versus Sephardic. Sephardic is another uh, group of, um, with uh, Jewish um, roots. But the Ashkenazi are actually from Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, where Hungary, Poland, Romania. Um, these are individuals that um, are uh, at a higher risk for developing the disease, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. But basically, about 90% of Ashkenazi Jewish in, are in this country are Ashkenazi Jewish. Sephardic, on the other hand, are, are those individuals that are coming from um, Spain, Portugal, Northern Africa. Again, that's a, another um, branch of uh, Judaism. So when I ask an individual, are you of Ashkenazi Jewish descent? We are looking because we know that these individuals have um, a slightly higher risk for developing cancer because one in 40 men or women actually carry a BRCA mutation, okay? BRCA, if some of you, um, is Bro the BRCA gene is what most people are aware of or know it by the name. So this, we can skip this slide, please, but this is basically um, just a list of, of what I'm looking for uh, when I look at someone's family history. But what I tell most people is this, there are four things that you need to be aware of. Number one, rare cancers. That means ovarian cancer is considered rare. Male breast cancer. If you have a brother or a father with breast cancer, that is an automatic, you know, let's talk about genetic testing. Multiple cancers, again, like I said, in an individual or in a family member. Young cancers, anyone diagnosed under the age of 50, you must have some, um, you know, knowledge of individuals who are diagnosed um, in their late 30s, early 40s. The youngest one I've seen is 29 that was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then, of course, ethnicity. So multiple cancers in an individual are on one side of the family that correlate with each other. So this is essentially what I'm talking about, is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, which means that you have this in your personal history or your family history, breast, ovarian cancer, uh, uh, pancreatic, or prostate. But there's also other groupings, for example, Lynch syndrome, which puts you at a higher risk for developing colorectal cancers, um, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer. So that's why we, you know, we're looking at that, and these are just examples of a family um, that would signal either one of these syndromes. So when we take that information, you'll, we'll um, go ahead and we just, you actually fill out the form and this is what it looks like when you are done filling it out. All the circles are female, all the squares are male. Anything filled in means that they have had a cancer. A slash through it just means that they have, uh, that they died from the disease. So this is what is, this, it's a lot easier to see it this way um, versus just listing it on a piece of paper. The, you can see here just from in a, this example that um, most of the cancers are on mom's side. So what if you come in and we get a family history and you don't meet any of the criteria for testing. It was just your mom that had breast cancer at 80. Well, you still might be at an elevated risk that could include getting, uh, in addition to an annual mammogram, starting at 40 or 10 years prior to the youngest cancer. So if your mom was diagnosed at 40, we recommend a mammogram starting at 30. Um, so, and we'll also 
advocate for an MRI, breast MRIs. Um, we talk about preventative medications. Some women can take tamoxifen, which is, um, will reduce the risk for developing breast cancer. And of course, we will talk to you, get you connected with diet, exercise, smoking cessation, alcohol, you know, elimination, all of those things that you can actually have some control over. For those that meet uh, genetic testing criteria, it is done by blood or saliva. So you spit in a tube, or if you can't do that, I can draw your blood. Um, the cost of the testing is generally covered by insurance. And I say this because sometimes when you have a deductible or all, you know, a share of costs, and those things we can review during the visit. But it's important to know that, you know, even the visit with me is covered under an insurance because it is billed as a doctor's visit. And the results come back in about three to four weeks. Okay, and um, I'll send you, uh, we'll talk about what the results are. So, with a negative result, woohoo, we're great, we're negative. That just doesn't mean that you are done and that you are not at an average risk, but still at an elevated risk. So just like those individuals that I talked about earlier that have an elevated risk, we will talk about, let's get you additional screening, let's get you in for an MRI. If you have a history of colon cancer in your family, let's get you in for an early colonoscopy. Um, those are um, things that we can do. We'll talk about medications if um, patients are interested. And then, of course, lifestyle modification. Now, let's talk about if you're positive. That is still good news. Believe it or not, um, when patients come into my office, they're always worried, oh my God, am I you know, a carrier? Well, the good news is you're sitting in my office doing something about it. And if you are positive, one, it explains the cancer that's running in your family. Okay, it explains, you know, why grandma had ovarian and mom had breast cancer. It also tells us that if you don't have cancer, you're in the right place. We can start looking and making sure that you do the right things. We can advocate for medications if you don't want to do the risk-reducing surgeries. For women that are carriers, BRCA1, BRCA2, their ovaries are at risk too. So what we need to do is talk about, are you done having kids? Because if you're not, let's get going because we want to try and remove those ovaries by around maybe 40, 45. Um, and then for those individuals who have cancer that are newly diagnosed, that are here for genetic testing, okay, so now we know you are a carrier, you're gonna have surgery. You might want to talk about both. Um, if not, you know, we can, you know, work. In other words, it's a very personal decision, but still, we now can say, okay, your risk now for developing a second cancer in the other breast or in this breast is gonna be higher than someone who is not. The one uh, thing that is difficult to explain and oftentimes hard for patients in general is what we call a variant of uncertain significance. So what that is, is they don't know. Basically, the lab is still trying to figure out what the heck this change in your gene is. And there could be 100 people that have the same change, but they still can't figure out whether or not it is gonna be in the cancer bucket or not. So this you know, is sometimes confusing, sometimes a little anxiety producing for patients because they're like, well, you know, it's inconclusive. And that's part of the limitations for genetic testing is as they continue to change, as it, medicine continues to change, we find a lot of different things. So um, basically, I'm gonna, if you could just go through these, because I know that Tony's probably gonna go over most of this. Um, basically, just making sure that you're doing what you can do to reduce your risk. So it's, you know, basically, you know, watch what you eat. Um, you know, and diets, there's plenty of different diets out there, but, you know, making healthy choices in what you choose to eat. Um, And then the second is exercise. Okay, gotta move it. 
American Cancer, Cancer Society recommends that you do either, you know, 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous. I mean, they recommend it to be, you know, every, um, at least two to three times a week. Um, smoking, not a good thing. So if you smoke, let's have you, give you some help to stop. And if you don't smoke, don't start. Alcohol intake, um, they recommend no more. It's recommended or, you know, just say, this is what I tell the patient. You can have a drink an evening, okay, for women. Men can have two. But basically one alcohol beverage, a, lick, uh, a shot of liquor, bottle of beer, or four ounces of wine. And why? Do they say that this puts you at an increased risk? Well, it causes a change in the DNA, which can, of course, then change into, you know, uh, developing a disease because it's not able to repair itself. So it's basically making changes in your DNA. I'm going to leave you with one case that I think is helpful. Um, this is a, I forget how old she is, but she is um, a woman that came in to see me um, about 10 or 15 years ago, and she had a, um, she was unaffected. She was of Japanese American ancestry, and she's 42. She has a daughter that was 15, a son 17, and if you see here, her mother had breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. And then her uncle, maternal uncle, had colon, but if you look at her first cousin, she also had breast cancer at 45 and died at 48. So this is a prime example of an individual who meets the criteria for genetic testing. Remember that Akiko is not affected. She has no cancer. She's young, she's healthy. So we did genetic testing on her, and um, this is what we found. So she's a BRCA2 carrier. So the decision now for her is, what am I going to do? I'm healthy. There's nothing going on. But is she done having kids? We can remove her ovaries if she is, you know, counseling about removing ovaries because her risk for ovarian cancer is high. Um, bilateral mastectomy, it's a big decision. But can, you know, it may be something that she is looking to, to reduce the risk for developing breast cancer at all. She has two children and a brother. So those children need to be tested when they reach 21, and um, so does her brother, in order to determine whether his sons. Yes, boys or men can carry the gene. They can develop breast cancer. They can develop pancreatic or prostate cancer. But if they get married someday or if they have children, those children, again, are at risk for, for, for um, inheriting that gene. So this is really what I um, uh, advocate for, is just knowing what your risk is. Um, next slide. So if you look at this one, it just shows that um, Akiko's, the general population's risk is about for ovarian cancer is about less than 1%, right? The lifetime risk for breast cancer for this individual is, you know, already for breast cancer is up to 87%. So what, you know, here's where we look at the graph, we look at the, the information and make that determination. So doing this can actually save lives. So do, again, we can skip this one because it's a personal plan of action. Just means that you know, once we get everything put together, we talk about what we need to do next, um, and then um, move forward from there. I would, will refer the patients essentially to whoever the um, specialist is. So if they need their ovaries removed and would like to talk to someone, we'll send them to a GYN, send them to a breast surgeon, um, for people that have Lynch syndrome, the colon genes, then send them to a GI so that they can, you know, um, 
up their, their frequency of their colonoscopies. So essentially, this is part of the screening. It is, and to me, and I know everyone here agrees that early detection is the key. You find it early, it's treatable, and you're over and moving forward. You find it late, it gets more complicated than that. So that's my talk. You can find me there. So yes, that's still on. I mean, that's what we—that's what women are counseled on. And um, in my experience, you know, there it just is a very personal choice. I've had a patient who went in and she was in surgery for hours, but she had a bilateral mastectomy and she had a hysterectomy at the same time. You know, in that day. So um, I've had young women who are not done having children yet. So they will maybe remove their breasts because they can formula feed, right? But they will keep their um, ovaries in their uterus until they're done having children. So, you know, there, there's been, it's a choice, but, you know, I really hope that they, they make, sh and make sure that they get the appropriate counseling and understand the risk before, you know, doing that. Yes, there, there are, we would have to sit down and look at it because it, your first degree relatives, mom, dad, and then your children, they may not have cancer or your brothers and sisters, but let's just say mom and her brothers and sisters have all had some sort of cancer, then you know what, it's worth a sit down.
you know, keeping ourselves health, healthy and prevent, preventing um, cancer as much as we can. So let's give a hand for Tony and Kim. Um, I need that to be louder when you clap. Let's go. Come on, clap. Let's go. Sorry, I, I don't like holding a microphone because I usually have one on my head. Um, good morning. Let's do this again. Good morning. morning. Jennifer knows I've, in my classes, I like energy, I like talking really loud, so being in the church, I'm gonna try to keep it down today. Um, As they stated, my name is Tony Buck. I do own uh, Body Zone Fitness. Um, You know, fitness is a passion of mine, and it started at a really early age. You know, eight years old, I started working out, um, and it kind of progressed throughout life you know, in high school, through college, um, to now adulthood. Um, When fitness really became important in my life was about 2009, when I actually started working in the fitness industry. Um, I was 300 pounds working in the fitness industry in sales. So it was kind of contradictive. Here's this overweight guy talking to you about a membership. Um, But more importantly, what I learned in that initial uh, time there was actually how to build relationships with people. Um, And it really, really established myself as wanting to take better care of myself, but more importantly, taking care of other people. Um, You know, being obese, I was very scared. I didn't want to go up and talk to people, especially about fitness, especially about nutrition. Um, Had a lot of health issues as well. You know, being an African-American male, you know, thinking like, oh, I'm healthy, and my doctor would always look at me, you need to lose weight, or else you're gonna die. You know, and so it always resonated, but I didn't take that initiative until actually I got insulted by somebody that I was showing around to the gym, and my boss had heard it. Uh, And in that moment, my boss actually kicked my door open (laughs) and started yelling at me. And I said, look, I don't need this right now. And he said, you don't have a choice. You have two options. You can start working out today, or you can pack your office up and get out of my building. And from that moment on, that kind of progressed my life into health and fitness and wanting to help people. So at my gym, that's what we focus on. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter how fit you are. It matters about, do you want the help? Because everybody wants to lose weight, everybody wants to live a long life, everybody wants to have less aches and pains when they get up in the morning, but you don't want to take the initiative to do it. And so when you walk inside of our building, that's what we talk to you about. It's not about can you do a push-up, can you squat, can you do this? It's do you want to live to your 70, 80, 90 years old? Most people do, but when it comes down to showing up, changing their habits, changing their minds, most importantly. Because that's where fitness starts, it starts here. We all get up, we do the various things, but it starts here, and so that's what we work with our clients on from day one. Where's your mind at? And going back to that point, my mind wasn't in the realm of wanting to get healthy. But once I started to do it, all of a sudden, my life changed. So like I said, I was 302 pounds, I ended up dropping almost 50 pounds within six months. Just because of dedication. See, we all have an expiration date, but we can extend it a little bit further if we take care of ourselves. And so when you walk into our gym, the first thing we do is an assessment, just like Maria. And it's not a physical assessment. I wanna see what's been going on in your body So I have a scale that I spent a lot of money on. Jennifer knows. I know everything once you get off that scale. I know how much you sleep. I can tell if you've been on medication or if you're currently on medications. If you've drank alcohol, if you're not drinking enough water, if you've had an injury some point in your life. Because once we have that information, that gives me the blueprint to help you out. As the, as the memo says, 3,200 clients that my teams have helped train over the last just six years. 
cancer survivors, kidney transplants, menopause, grandmothers, mothers, daughters, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, it does not matter. Fitness should be a part of your life every single day. And it doesn't matter if you're going to a gym or you're doing something on YouTube. How many people go on YouTube to watch a video? Few hands. You know there's over a thousand free YouTube channels for exercise? Free. No money. Free. How many of you have kids? How many of your kids exercise or Get your kids involved. The most powerful thing that, and it just happened this week, and I took a picture of it, is when I see mothers working out with their daughters. When I see husbands working out with their wives. See, fitness is always built on a community, right? And that's, that's the other part of our gym, is we're a community and we're a family. We support each other. There's no egos in my building. I have one rule, you have an ego, there's a door you can get out. If you're not here to support, then we don't need you. Because fitness is about get, being supportive, helping one another, getting stronger, getting healthier in, in its own way. Let me get back on topic because I can get on a rant. Jennifer knows that. Um, so back to what I was saying in regards to lifestyle, exercise, as uh, Maria had pointed out in her slide, you know, just a few short minutes a day, you can get exercise. 30 minutes. As simple as walking around your neighborhood a couple times. Grabbing three pound weights. They're about $8 down the street at Big Five Sporting Goods. Hold them in your hand. Walk around. Because cancer, all these other elements that we have going on in our bodies, at any given point can be prevented through exercise. As I mentioned, we have clients that, well, I have a client right now who is fighting for her life because she has cancer. But she comes three days a week. I mean, the woman has been in the hospital, got out of the hospital and showed up to come work out. And I said, why are you here? She's like, because I can't give up. I have to keep fighting. Even though my body is fighting against me, I need to keep going. So with your lifestyle, just think, what, what do you want to get out of your life, number one? Do you want to keep having the ailments that are going on, or do you want to get them fixed? Because exercise can fix them. I've had a herniated disc, bad knee, bad back, everything, because I was overweight for way too long. So it took a lot of damage onto my body. And within a few years, I was actually to get rid of all of those ailments because of exercise. See, exercise has that reverse effect. Just because you have an ailment doesn't mean you need to stop. It means you need to figure out where is this ailment and how can I correct it and what do I need to do? And then talking about nutrition, how, I always ask this question to my clients. Just by a show of hands, how many of you eat at least three meals a day? Two times a day. One time a day? Who doesn't eat at all? <laughs> okay, that's good. The one time a day, I'm gonna talk to you separately. Okay, we'll talk afterwards. No, eating is important. And when it comes down to nutrition, that is more important than how, how you're moving your body. Because what you put into your body fuels your body. And if you're always tired, or you're always having that brain fog, or by two o'clock you literally hit that wall and you crash, that's your body t talking to you about eating more, eating the right things. I was horrible with eating. That's how I got to 302 pounds. I am from the East Coast. I love cheese steaks and cheese fries. Sorry, that's just one of my staples. Um, but 
what I had to learn was how to control those things so my body didn't start to pack on that additional weight, right? So what I started doing was eliminating those things. If you were to look at your, how many of you eat fried foods? Oof. Soda. Who's a soda drinker? Juice? Ooh, yeah. A lot of things, what, hot, what they call high fructose syrup. You all have heard it. What if you were able to cut just one of those things out each day? Do you think you would feel better or feel worse? If you were to eat one more meal a day, would you feel better or feel worse? So as of Monday, start doing it. Don't wait a month and just because the holidays are coming doesn't mean anything. I don't want to hear, oh, it's Christmas, it's Thanksgiving. You can still be on a restriction even on those holidays. Getting into my last point, sleep. I heard a couple, mm. So how many of you get at least six hours of sleep? Okay. Seven? Seven? Okay. Anyone get less, like five, four hours of sleep, insomnia? Okay. That plays a part into your health as well. If you're not, if you, let's say you're working out, you're eating right, but you're not sleeping right, that affects your body too. Like I told you, on my scale, I can tell when one of my clients has had a bad week of sleeping. And the first question I ask them is, I say, hey, how's your sleeping been this week? Oh, Tony, it's been so erratic. Yeah, I can tell. First line here tells me that you haven't slept well this week. Sleep is so important because your body needs that rest. That's when your body is burning the most amount of calories. That's when your body is just rejuvenating itself for the next day's work. So ensuring that you get enough sleep is truly, truly helpful. Stress level. Everybody laughing today, okay. Uh, let's see. Stress from eight to 10, that's really high. Raise your hand. Wow, okay. Six and seven, kind of like, I kind of got some stress, but I can manage it. All right, I see a lot of people that don't have any stress at all. So raise your hand because a lot of the rest of you. Stress is big too. So reducing your stress through exercise and nutrition helps prolong your life. I, I live a very stressful lifestyle. I, I run a gym. I have a wife who's a nurse. Uh, we have dog, you know, we have a lot of things going on, but we, we manage our stress. When you start to manage all of those things, your body, again, starts to work in your benefit. If you've never had a stress test, get one. If you have an Apple Watch, it's perfect because it actually shows you your heart rate. The best thing to do to see how your body responds to stress, when you start getting stressed out, if you have an Apple Watch, turn it on and see where your heart rate goes. It's so key to manage that because then when you're through fitness, because then your body can manage it better. So I did a test back in, starting in 2018, on myself, because again, I'm always trying to get better at just being healthier. Um, and for a year, I actually tracked my heart rate. Every workout, I tracked every time I did something. And what I started to do was I started to play around with my heart rate so that when I got into those stressful moments, I wasn't panicking. And you can ask my wife, we've been underneath some stressful situations and she would look at me and go, why are you so calm? I go, I trained for this. So now my body is prepared. I can think more clearly. I'm not having an outburst. How many of you have, you know, you can be hot headed at one point in time? Raise your hand, be honest with yourself. Right. But even in those situations, it's still, 
if you're exercising, exercise is stress on the body, but it teaches you how to control that. It teaches you how to control your blood flow. It teaches you how to take a deep breath, relax. I shouldn't say relax. My wife is watching this. She doesn't like that word, but I said relax. <laughs> but these are all important things to remember. Yes, you have a question? Yep. Highest point of the day is usually between 8 and 10. It's your cortisol levels. So a lot of times you don't see it, and I suffered from it too. So how I started to discover that I was having those issues was my stomach. Started feeling more bloated, especially early in the morning. Early in the morning is the highest risk when we start to have heart attacks and things of that nature because we're, uh, I think it was back in 2015, 12, I heard this stat. Um, it's because we're either driving, getting ready for work, you know, just that anxiety of the morning. But your cortisol levels are the indication. If you start to feel like you get a little bit of a headache when those stressful moments come, that's because the adrenaline glands are, are pumping out that cortisol, which is running through your body. That's how you can really tell when it's coming on. Cortisol is the number one factor why you gain the belly fat, the belly fat, you know, the hip fat, because you're putting yourself under that stress, so your, your body is naturally doing it. You can't control it unless you know how to, which most of us don't even know. Like you said, most of us don't know that it's happening, but then all of a sudden we start to feel these aches and pains. Take note of those. That is so important. Why am I feeling like this? Getting back to your nutrition, when you eat, I ask my clients this as well. When you're eating something, do you want to go to sleep or do you have energy? Because when you start list, looking at those signals, that's an indication of something. See, a lot of us just go through life and not picking up on those little signals that our body is starting to throw out to us until it's too late. We go to the doctor and then the doctor tells us, oh, you have, you know, high this and high that. When your body was telling you the whole time, you just have to understand what you're, what you're reading into or what your body is trying to signal. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. I've been like that since I was probably 17 years old. I can tell when my body is having a cold and in an instant I am trying to fix it. And I know it sounds weird, but we all have those, those signs. We just have to pay attention to them, right? So with fitness and exercise, or just exercise, nutrition, there's so many components that we can control. It's about controlling them. How do you gain control? You build habits. Like I said, with the juice, with the eating, when you start putting together a plan, you build those healthy habits, your body starts to respond. You start to feel better about yourself. But more importantly, you start to reduce those, those factors for like breast cancer or any type of cancer, diabetes, right? All of those things start to slowly come down. And the last thing, basically kind of going into what I let off with is consistency. Don't do it for six months and stop. Say, oh, you know, I did it for six months, I'm done. It is a journey. Just keep going. Even on the days where you don't feel like, oh, I don't want to eat healthy, or I don't want to exercise, or I don't want to um, go to bed early because I need to get this amount of sleep, just do it. Because the more you do it, the more you train your mind. Again, going back to your mind, your body is going to fall in line with it. And especially for, and, I, and I'm speaking because majority of the, of the faces in the room are African-American. We need to start exercising. We need to start exercising. Because a lot of the things that I see, especially from my clients who are African-American, and then 
they're usually the first ones to walk out the door. But yet, they're unhappy. Yet, they're still walking around with the same challenges they had. It's about committing. It's commit committing to yourself. How important is your family to you? If you have kids, some of you raise your hands, you have kids, you have a husband. How important are they to you? And I'll, I'll, the reason why I'm so passionate about fitness, um, I lost my best friend two years ago at 38 years old to a heart attack. And I've buried more friends in my lifetime, and I'm only 41 years old, I've buried 60 friends in my lifetime from all various reasons. But a vast majority of them because of their health. So when you take care of your health, again, it will take care of you. If you have questions, I'm always available. If you want me to start teaching a class here, I will walk in this building and teach a class. I am a member here, so I have no problem coming here and helping out this community because I want to see it, everyone. It's not about money for me. It's about helping. Helping my community. Helping people in general get just to feel better about themselves. That's why I'm passionate about what I do, and I will continue doing it until God says, hey, I got something else for you. But by all means, reach out. If you have questions about you know, your nutrition, exercise regimen, exercise videos, let me know. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. Before I sit down, any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Um, I everything but meditation. Because yes. I did, I took a class about 10 years ago in, in meditation, really, because I was stressed out. Yeah. And she was telling me, she said, because regardless of whether or not you are doing anything, your mind still make your body go through everything. Yes. So she was telling me, she said, cut the tape. Yes. And that helped me more than anything, because regardless of where I am, she said, does it happen the way you think? If it doesn't, don't think about it. Cut it. Yes. And that helped me more with all kinds of stress, everything. Yes. So when I get into a stress relationship, I just start breathing. Yes. It just taught me how to do all that. Yeah, I actually used to look in it. And trust that. You're so right. That's why I'm going to ask you the question that you mentioned everything but meditation. Yes. And most of the time it starts here. Yes. Um, and it's a great point because when I took a, I took a meditation class at my, one of my old gyms, and you're right because always stressed out because yes. of my mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. and so I, every Wednesday I would take that class and I would get mad. I took it one day a week and it changed yes. my life. Because I fell asleep. I would fall asleep and I, that's why I would get hesitant about taking the class because I told the instructor, I said, look, I feel weird because I'm snoring. He goes, no, that's a signal that your body needs that mm -hmm. and you're right and you're, you're I didn't have notes. So I no, no, that's okay because I, went, uh, because I work at the sheriff's department. Okay. And we every get stressed, you know, you can feel everything yes. coming. And everyone at work has said, you are the most people. Because so I said, I need to tell people, I said, most people of us don't take meditation. And I paid $200, and that's the best $200 I ever paid in my life. It was at local? It was did? at the one of the uh, hospitals. Oh. And they, had a, and they had a nurse come in. Right. And she had anyone, you have all kinds of medical problems, anything. It changed everybody. It didn't matter what you started with. Pain and everything. Yeah. Because what people don't realize is the brain is, it starts here. Yep. That's matter what you do. And that's actually a good point, too, because every, I tell my clients, they're like, why do you wake up at 2.30 in the morning? I spend the first 30 minutes meditating. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why 
that's too early. I said, well, why not? She told us how to maybe eat, walk, exercise. She told us how to meditate in every form. Yep. When you drive, you just punch it on your driver. And uh, Tony Robbins is just uh, he has the same person to drive for five feet. So I was trying to tell my cousin because she's all stressed out. And she was like, I can't relax. I was like, breathe. And she didn't understand what I'm talking about. Yes. But it starts with deep inhale, mm -hmm. deep exhale, mm -hmm. right? There's a, with your cousin, there's an app that's called um, Better Sleep, mm -hmm. but it's designed. She can't sleep or anything because she's in constant pain, but she can't relax. And it's hard to teach someone to relax if they don't know that technique. Right, and that's also affecting because of her stress. That's why she's in pain. She's that body is tensing up all the time. Yes. Right? And she's probably having this pain, that pain, not realizing. But it's called Better Sleep. Right, and she can create sounds that help her relax. So, like when I'm on an airplane, mm -hmm. like when I first get on, I'm very, oh my god, oh my god. But, but you know what? We really need more so is people to hear that because a lot of people don't do that exercise like that, right. but they learn to really know what's going on inside. And that was she was teaching us. She said, when you feel pain, she said, forget about it. Whatever yep. you feel, just breathe. Yep, center. It's called finding your center. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yoga. Yeah. We yeah, used yeah, to do. Uh, having me. Me. Thank you You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. You, you see what I'm saying? Because I noticed that you did everything but that, and that had meaning. Yes. And I, can, I do all the other stuff now. You should have raised your hand, because I would have talked about that so much, because you are you are right. It's, it, it is it is. Because I was like, raise the hand, but I said, no, he didn't mention that, so I don't want to bring up <laughs> no, this whole new topic. No, that's what this is for. Because you didn't touch it all. I'm like, but I what had me was meditation, but it was nothing that we did. I went in because I was so stressed. Yep. And I said, well, I'm going to try this. And, and, and look it at you now. Yeah. And keep doing it. Yeah. And keep doing it. And mm -hmm. even when you don't realize you're doing it, it uh -huh. she told us, like, it was like a, I don't know, three or four months. Because we just went every once a month, or once a week. Yes. And she did, and you, it's an in train. You don't even know you're doing it. Yeah. But my, my, my boss said something. She said, You need the conversations, everything, the phone your parts, and you just sit there. That's how I am. She said, You're sitting there. That's how I am. My family could be running around, and I'm just sitting there going. Because they said, Does it affect you? She said, If it doesn't, cut it. Yep. Does it affect me? I'm done with it. 80 20 rule of life. That's what my, fr my friend's dad taught me that a few years, uh, few years ago. That is 100%. Of things that go on around you, you can't control all of it. Yeah. Just focus on 20% of it and you'll be fine. And I'm like, that's it? Okay. He's right though. As we said, we have nothing to talk about because you're an Eagles fan, so we cannot talk. So, What's your team? Giants. Oh. So we, I'm done hey. with you. Hey, I'm, I'm I grew good. up in between. I don't, I'm on the East Coast too. I'm done. I'm done with you. It's soon. okay. It's okay. <laughs> I like and we, when we bring home this Super Bowl, because we're going to beat you guys, we're going to beat you at least once. No, I don't think so. We're going to beat you the first time. What's so funny is my brother's an Eagle fan. I have a sister that's a Cowboy fan. I'm a Giant fan, and the other one is a comma, you know, Commander, whatever they are. The Reds. <laughs> yeah. So you got the whole dynamic. You remember? You know, I, I, you know, I'm talking much trash because you know we're in second place. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I'm talking much trash. You remember? Uh, so I, mean, I, I should have asked him the Chris, question because uh, I didn't realize he was doing everything but there. meditation. Uh, He's a oh, family yeah. friend of ours. Is he, oh, that that was yeah. You know what? I have a, 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 a gentleman I worked with his wife. Ten years ago. Him and Eli and went to school together. Wow. And I'm just waiting for I'm just waiting for him to get Eli out. Right. Of right. I told him once I meet Eli, I can die happy. <laughs> it's, there's a totally different time. Yeah. Yeah. But you can go ahead. But yeah, we it's can't, okay. We, we, we can't talk. We're going to see you on uh, week after 14. The, after the season, we'll see who's on top. And then maybe but I, Tony, if I'm on top, I'll talk to you. But thank you. I'm going to mention that because that will happen to me. Yeah. The meditation. The meditation. The meditation. And so there were a lot of people, and then such people of color don't really think. I don't know, we, I was at work, and they had two people that she was a Filipino lady and a Hispanic lady went to a meditation class. She said, I was bored because we didn't do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they came back more stressed. That's why yoga. I said, all right, but you're supposed to relax. Yeah. <laughs> they, now they're the most stressful people at work, and everyone at work, you wonder why they always come. I said, because you learn how to breathe. You realize it's not about you. 
Yeah, that's That's what I was telling him because you mentioned empty breath meditation, but a lot of people of color don't hear meditation. Sure. He said, that's why I asked him because that helped me the most. I, I and that mean, was just a topic that I'm from, I was so stressed at work because I was at the church department. Okay. And I read, and it, it doesn't matter what you're doing, they said, you're always calm. <laughs> yeah, because when you, when you meditate, you learn to center. Yep. That's and what I, I asked, I was going to ask you that question, but I said, well, he didn't even mention nothing about meditation. And I said, that should be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> I I am. <laughs> no, because no, uh, in uh, like in all honesty, I think something that a, a class we need to be a pro- no, we need to bring to special African Americans because I know it came by me because I was in such stress. And someone said, "What's that time meditation?" I said, "Well, I'm the first time we try new yep. things." We naturally walk around with right. a higher heart rate than. But than you can bring, and you and then you do a meditation on everything. You eat, sleep, everything. I, I measure, I measure, like, it's called your resting heart rate. That's how you know you're centered. So, like, when I'm at home and I'm in bed, my heart rate's at 32. Whoa. My, my wife being yeah. a nurse, she, like, looks at it. She's like, what? Yeah, I'm at 32. She's like, I'm at 60 and I'm laying down. And I'm like, because you're always stressed out. Yeah. I was like, I'm not. When I wake up, I'm kind of... All right, here we go. And maybe you should get up and, and maybe you mention to yeah. I will. That, that really helped me. Mm-hmm. And we don't get that because I'm from, I talk to people meditation. What meditation? Yeah. <laughs> but it was just $200 and she taught me the best. And she told me that anything you were going through, meditation. your body goes through. I forgot to mention that. Go through. Oh, yeah. you know, run to the your body goes through. through. Yeah. Everything, yeah. Even if you're not doing anything, you're still doing it. Oh, she didn't even tell me about me the she PowerPoint. Cut the tape. I could have had a whole PowerPoint. The way you thought. You know I like that. The answer is no. Then don't think about it. Just let it happen. Oh, I didn't think that. That's what she said. Yeah. Tony, you just told me. You just said, cut the tape. I said, you need to do that. Everyone was fine with that. And they said, said, you need to take a piece of it. I said, no, no, I'm going to tell you what. I, for $200, I learned that money. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not doing it, because your body still thinks you're in here, mm-hmm. it's still going through it regardless of yeah. when you move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cut the tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cut the tape. So no, when I did ask him that, because he mentioned everything but meditation, I just want to know. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. And I'm bringing up the rear, so bear with me. I'm going to stay here and reference my slides um, because I was working late last night and I added a couple more. So you won't see everything, but I'll just talk about what I added. Um, So the tips that I'm going to share with you are just about reducing your risk. Um, They are from the Carol Hatton Breast Care Center, which is part of CHOMP. They were um, posted this month for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And then I'm just gonna highlight and and, um, add to a few of them. So these are the eight tips to reduce your risk. Get regular mammograms, we talked about that, annual screening. Get active, Tony did a great presentation on that. Limit alcohol, Maria also talked about that and I'll talk about that just a little bit more. 
quit, spo quit smoking, don't start if you don't. Um, keeping a healthy weight, breastfeeding is also another really important um, component of reducing your risk for the mamas. Um, consider your birth control options, something to talk about with your provider, and eating a healthy, balanced diet. So the highlighted ones that you see here are the ones that I'm gonna concentrate on, if, if you can see it on the slide that it's highlighted. So with alcohol, um, the more you drink, the greater your risk, um, just across the board. Um, the American Cancer Society says that alcohol contributes to about 6% of cancers in the US. This is all cancers, not just breast. So liver, stomach, mouth, colon. Um, any reduction in your intake improves your risk. So, and that, that's with nutrition too. Like any small changes matter. You don't have to be perfect, none of us are. Um, but small weight losses, small nutrition changes, small reductions in alcohol, it all matters. Um, and then likewise, any small amounts of increased alcohol can also contribute to an increased risk. And part of the reason um, that research is suggesting that alcohol can raise estrogen levels, which are a risk factor for breast cancer, it can also be an irritant to other tissues, it causes damage to your DNA, leads to oxidative stress. It can also interfere with absorption of various vitamins um, in our food. So it's, it's definitely a risk factor. And then Maria also talked about some of the, um, you know, the sizes of, of a serving, a serving size. And so there, if you can see that on the slide there, um, according to the CDC, um, past studies have suggested, which gets a little confusing, that, that moderate alcohol intake can have health benefits. We've probably heard about wine and heart health. Um, Bigger studies, longer studies, more recent studies are suggesting that that's actually not true. Um, so if you don't drink, don't start. Mm -hmm. And if you can cut back, uh, mm -hmm. do so. Um, eating a healthy, balanced diet. I mean, we're told eat healthy. What does that mean? It's confusing. Data is all over the place. I mean, we read, you know, keto diets, high fat, low fat, high calorie, intermittent fasting, it's, it's all over the place. And um, a whole other talk on why nutrition data is so confusing and we could spend an hour. But I think across the board, experts agree that eating more fruits and vegetables will help. So loading up is, is one sure way to reduce your risk. Um, In general, the, the darker the color, the higher the antioxidants. So your dark leafy greens, um, reds, yellows, all the bright colors. The, the more color a, a fruit or vegetable has, the better it is for you. Um, and as far as just, you know, we don't want to not enjoy our food. Um, some things, you know, we just don't want to try, so it's important to introduce new things, maybe share something new um, with a family or a friend, um, focus on what you can add rather than what you need to maybe cut back on. One thing that I've, I've recommended is, you know, so, so often our side dishes are our fruits and vegetables. Make that your main dish and make your main dish your side dish, kind of reverse the ratios on your plate can help you bulk up on some of the fruits and vegetables. Um, eating mindfully, taking your time. Don't eat in front of the TV, your phone, your computer. Um, you know, one of the audience members talked about meditation. Meditation can be incorporated into your meal. You know, really, you know, feel some gratitude for your food, how it's nourishing your body. And, and I think, you know, it'll slow you down. It'll help you consume a little bit less. Um, so just being mindful about what you're eating and, and what the food is doing for you um, as, is as important as how it tastes too. And I think, you know, just slowing down and, and being mindful. Focusing on fiber is so important. Um, fiber also helps you feel full longer. I did add a slide on fiber that I don't think is in here, so I'll read, I'll read some of that too. 
So fueling up on fiber, you cannot see this slide. So um, adding high fiber foods does lower your cancer risk. Um, high fiber foods tend to be our fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, legumes, all of those um, nutrient rich foods, which also contain a lot of antioxidants, which helps um, combat inflammatory changes in our bodies. Um, many of these foods are also high in protein. That's, a, that's a, another topic too, but we, we are told to eat your protein, eat your protein, eat your protein. Americans are not protein deficient. We are fiber deficient. Um, we get plenty of protein. In fact, breast milk is only about 5% protein, and that is a time in a person's life where you're growing so fast, yet breast milk has this much protein. We get too much. Um, unless you have major digestive changes, such as you're missing a big section of your colon or you've had to have your stomach removed, we're talking major digestive changes where um, you know, protein does, you know, there's a small portion of the population. We get plenty. All food has protein. Um, fiber helps with weight control. It helps you feel full longer. It helps lower cholesterol, stabilize blood sugar. And the daily recommendation is 25 to 30 grams a day. Most Americans get about half of that. So we need to definitely look at that. Um, processed and red meats. According to the American Cancer Society, um, also you don't see this slide, so I'll just read this. Um, processed meats such as sausage, bacon, hot dogs, lunch meats are classified as human carcinogens. Um, red meat is considered, considered probable, whereas the processed meats are carcinogens, meaning they can cause cancer in our bodies and it's the preservatives in the processed meat, such as nitrates and nitrites, um, as well as the heme iron that leads to the cellular changes in your body that, that can lead to um, cancer occurring. Um, and then, you know, we add insult to injury when we take those processed meats and then we expose them to high heat. So smoking, grilling, um, curing, cooking them at really high temperatures um, just accelerates the unfortunate process. Um, so alternatives to um, some of those meats, choose poultry, fish, beans. Um, I love beans. I think everybody should try to get in about a cup a day, work up to it. <laughs> um, but they're they're little nutrition powerhouses. In my house, I tell my kids that Larry is the gentle lentil, and we try to eat a lot of it every day. Um, so, let's see. Um, maintaining a healthy weight. This may be another slide. Oh, yay, it's there. Um, so, obesity and breast cancer. Um, obesity is defined as a BMI of 30 or greater. Um, I just recently completed my master's degree and my thesis was on obesity and breast cancer. Um, Jennifer did not know that when she asked me to speak to you today, so it was kind of serendipitous, but um, I have studied this topic a lot. Um, I focused on postmenopausal women, and so Maria talked about that a bit too, on being female, we're all getting older. Um, some things we cannot control, but many things we can. So um, our weight is, is one of them, and, it, and you don't have to make these huge changes, but little gradual changes, and be forgiving of yourself. We're all going to you know, wax and wane, and I think slow, wide turns are the best turns. We don't have to you know, set ourselves up to fail by making sudden, sharp turns as far as the changes in our body. Um, so BMI of 30 or greater is considered obese. Waist to hip ratio needs to also be considered. Um, calculating your uh, waist to hip ratio is very easy. You just divide your waist circumference by your hip circumference. And the number that you get, if it's 0.85 or greater, this is your typical apple body shape, 
um, that is considered to be a higher risk. Higher risk for um, metabolic diseases, so that's where you know, your type 2 diabetes, heart disease, a lot of the lifestyle, truly preventable diseases, um, you're at higher risk for those. Um, breast cancer, um, any cancers are linked to, you know, that, um, that risk setting the stage for inflammatory changes in the body. So obesity affects hormone, la la hormone level, excuse me, promotes cell and blood vessel growth, increases inflammation in the body, and it's linked to very complex chemical processes. That takes time, and um, I think one of the, the questions that we had a little bit ago was about stress and the time frames. I mean, little, you know, chronic stress causes little inflammatory changes in the body. Cells, our bodies are smart, and we, we we start, um, you know, we, we can fix a lot of these changes along the way, but as time goes by, it just becomes a little bit difficult for our body to always be in that fight mode, which is why symptoms can often be delayed. Um, and that, I mean, that is basically, um, the gist of what I wanted to share, um, and then just you know really reinforce that all small changes matter. It, Tony also talked about a little bit of community working together. I think that's one thing in our in our culture collectively that we've lost. Um, we try to do everything on our own all the time, and we we define ourselves by what we alone can do. But it takes a village. We need each other. People need to work together. We, um, you know, I think we're oftentimes more accountable to other people than we are to ourselves. So reaching out to whatever your network of support is is so important. And that will reduce stress when you do things together. Um, and it's fun, you know, make friends and just en enhance that camaraderie. I'm always trying to just get to know our neighbors, um, ha having my kids know whose house they can go to if I'm running late, who can help get them on the bus, you know, as a mom with that stress always lingering, you know, we need to know who we can count on. So I'm open to any questions. I'm going to put up my email address too. Um, I like one-on-one. -on -one. I like <laughs> individual questions and um, sharing any information. I really love being a resource. Um, public speaking is not my comfort zone. But I really appreciate Jennifer asking me to come. I have a question. Yeah. Is there some type of coalition where the breast care center and maybe some of these food places can get together? You know, we talk about food and vegetables, we talk about food and healthy, but stuff is mm hot. -hmm. I'm single. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I buy two beets, five apples, five pears, and carrots. Yeah. And that's $100. So expensive. If you got a boatload of children, well, two children is a boatload these days. Mm -hmm. But if you have children, <laughs> you absolutely cannot afford to, to do the five, cup, five servings a it's day. It's expensive. So yeah. while we know it's important, folks need help in, you yeah. know, gas is high. I pay $400 a month in gas to get to work, just to get to work. Wow. And so, you know, hence, one meal a day. Right, okay. You can't afford it. You can't afford it. So there needs to be some type of coalition between somebody to make it healthier or easier or cheaper for people with children. Yeah. You know, to, you know, get, you know, you got three children, you well, get a four and a half a day. I know. That's not it. So mm -hmm. I know. I know we talk about what we need to do, mm -hmm. but somebody needs to help us do it. I think, um, and I, I, I wish I knew specifics on um, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. I think the farmers markets are trying to um, help with in increasing access and affordability. Um, I mentioned loving beans. Beans and legumes are so inexpensive. You can buy a bag of lentils for $2 and make a huge pot of soup. And that's what I do, and that's what my kids pack for lunch. Um, 
it's so cheap to make bean soups, and I can happy to share recipes. Um, canned beans are a little bit more expensive than dried, so I do cook my own. Part of it from a waste perspective, you know, my little bio includes planetary health, so I hate food waste. Um, so I do cook everything from scratch. I cook a lot. I love to cook. Um, but beans are one of the cheapest foods you can buy, and they are nutritional powerhouses. So, so important. So, yes, the fresh fruits and vegetables are expensive. Frozen is fine, totally fine. So finding good um, recipes with dried beans or canned beans, nutritionally, they're about the same. Canned, I would get a, a low salt or no salt version, um, usually about a dollar a can. So you can get a can or a bag, say, of lentils. When you cook it, is probably about four cans worth. So it's more, or it's about a quarter of the price when you break it down. So um, I think that from a cost savings, that's probably my biggest tip that comes to mind. But um, it's very cheap to, to cook dried beans. And if you also factor in you know, the cost of prescription medications and health care and the duration of, you know, healthy habits. I mean, I think we can see changes fairly quickly with our bowels, <laughs> with, um, you know, making, making those healthful changes. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Some of the antioxidants do break down um, fiber and the, you know, the low calorie factor and the antioxidants are all still intact. A lot of the frozen vegetables are um, steamed before they're frozen and as you cook, some of the, um, the antioxidants are lost, but still a ton there. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Right, Thank you. Today for our event, we learned uh, so much uh, about um, stopping the silence against breast cancer, learning exactly what breast cancer is um, with um, our first presentation um, from Ms. Maria about the abnormal cells. Um, and how that it can uh, grow or the threats that occur um, to those cells um, as time goes on. And we've learned about the genetic risk for breast cancer as well. We've learned about how we can use the activity um, that we are involved ourselves in to help prevent um, not just cancer but other ailments um, through, our, through the presentation um, with Tony. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about fitness and classes, and so hopefully you have some uh, contact information you can leave with us as well. And then other preventive measures that we can take um, for breast cancer uh, as well through the presentation from Ms. Allison. One thing that came to mind as I was sitting there and listening to our presentations today um, was how we can use some of our own practices um, in order to um, incorporate them into our daily lives, some of the things that we already do. Um, I heard that mention about meditation. That means we can actually take the grace that we say before we eat. We'll actually take the time to say grace, to mindfully consider what it is that you're about to eat, not just in the practice of your religion, but in the practice of being mindful of how you're eating, what you're eating, and how much in front of you is what is in the state that God made it. Um, you know, considering those things as well as we, um, in our daily course, that don't take up any extra time, but it's something that we likely already do that we can incorporate um, into our daily um, process. There was a sign in sheet, so if you did provide your email address, then we can um, follow up with some more resources as they're shared from our panelists and other um, 
that are shared with us, and we'll be more than happy to share that those with you as well. I did want to take a moment to acknowledge um, our SOAR president, Dr. Betty Lusk, who is joining us here today, and all the other um, SOARs who have joined us from um, the Monterey Peninsula Alumni Chapter, um, Delta Sympathy Sorority. Just wave your hand and say hello. So we thank you so much for um, coming and joining us today. Uh, before I bring up our organizer, I do want to ask if our uh, Dr. Lust would like to say just a few words just to address the crowd and um, give us some thoughts. If you may. First and foremost, I really want us to give our panelists another round of applause. The excellent information that you have shared with us today really, really will assist us in living a better quality of lives, okay? And my connection to your history, Sister Maria, uh, mom, grandmother, mother, with breast cancer, and uh, all the prevention techniques that uh, you shared, Dr. My Dr. Markson, it just really works to make sure that that I stay healthy. I'll tell me to be. I'm joining. Okay, very sure. By the way, okay. <laughs> Eagles. <laughs> I know Eagles. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to chatting with you after, which is I need to. Um, I need you to just help me create a new life. It's 100 plus is what I want to do. Okay? Let's go. All right. <laughs> and Allison, it's such a pleasure to hear that I'm doing pretty good with my food. My uh, green drinks are making a difference, but I need to do more with the fiber, and all of us do. So I'm just grateful. And we are having a health conference um, in March, and we are certainly inviting you right now. <laughs> to be a part of a uh, big speaker at that conference because it will include a great uh, more of the community and what have you. We'll have it at the Open Life Center. It's a co sponsored uh, conference that we have annually, uh, co sponsored by the city of Seaside. And so we celebrate longevity the people that have done all that you have described to be 80 plus years young. And so we're inviting you now, so we'll give you the date, so we can put it on your calendar. And now, as I close, stand up, not a chair, stand up. Let's give her a big I have her something that's going to help her relax. Some, some socks that was given, and if they are, they are breast cancer focused. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, committee members, for the work that you've done. And this is just the beginning of what, the message that we want to really share with the community um, as an organization. We have what we call programmatic trust, which is looking at physical, mental health. And uh, now we are going to carry it forward thanks to the wonderful work of this committee. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And next time, Ms. Jennifer Allen. Yeah. I, I, am, I am so thankful. I have to say when I, when I asked each of the um, panel guests to speak, they were just like, yeah. All right. And then I, I had a vision that, oh, Shop. And I reached out to my wife and said, come see. And they did. So I'm so 
hopefully you all enjoyed the night, enjoyed our morning, the day of the information. We really appreciate everyone that's here. We want to thank you all for coming. Um, if you're interested in getting the information, it is streaming live on Facebook, so you can check it out on the Greater Temple Church uh, website, um, Greater Temple Church Facebook page, if you want to review the information that was given. And a uh, great thank you again to our, um, to our family members. How do we get these three guys? <laughs> we could talk afterwards. <laughs> well, make sure you negotiate something. You don't need it. Um, <laughs> hold on. I also have some information outside of the yeah. there, There's no negotiation needed. Anyone in this room will get a free month to my gym. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm about giving back. It's not about <clears throat> money comes and goes but we're only here for a short amount of time. So, you know, it's all about helping the community and it starts just getting, your, just getting out there. You know, like I tell all the clients, you start here, you progress to something else, but don't stop. So, see me after.